collector's diary special impromptu book haul supplemental captain's log all that stuff 60s 70s 80s maybe a bit of 90s as well so vintage vintage for those of you who like vintage this is what it's all about so today i went to warminster book festival not a book fair book festival it was a charity event kind of thrown together by some local sports thing but dorset bob was there with some stuff for me which we'd arranged beforehand and also morris of zardoz all you need is books if you're on facebook there's the vintage and pulp sort of collector thread there i'll stick it in the description because it's really good fun and i got a load of stuff and i've just come back i didn't film there because quite frankly <laughs> it wasn't worth filming apart from what the guys had and i've got a ton of stuff so we're just going to go through it so this is disorganized as it comes and what have you and we'll just see what comes out of it really. but i know you enjoy it it's a changeable day First of all, I'm going to show you what I got from Morris. If you are not familiar with these names, if you've never watched before, do check out the channel. If you put Dealer Warehouse and you'll see various things coming out. Morris um, runs All You Need Is Books, Zardo's Books, which is a warehouse in the wilds of Wiltshire, which has about 100,000 books in it. And um, you'll see several videos of me and Jules Burt visiting there. I'm having a milkshake because I need the B12 at the moment, banana. Robert Randall, The Shrouded Planet. Now, Robert Randall, of course, is the pseudonym of the collaborative novels written by Robert Silverberg and Randall Garrett, who was a bit of a lad, a um, bit of a ladies' man, wrote the wonderful Lord Darcy stories. I haven't got any of their work collaboratively. It's minor stuff. I tend to go for Silverberg in the period between 67 and 76 few things either side of that there are some good things before that I'm not a completist there's a huge amount but it was there and Morris had it and I thought well I'll give that a go and see what they were like in collaboration to actually find out what it's really really all about so that's that so do excuse me <clears throat> as I say I'd been in contact with the guys beforehand and was just sort of really just collecting stuff there was another dealer there who had quite a lot of SF a lot of it was first it was ex libraries and terrible states so I didn't bother so what else did I get from Zardoz well I noticed this I think Matt Defoe at Science Fiction Reads had a copy Charles Sheffield he says that nobody talks about Charles Sheffield apart from him so I do as well I've mentioned him before and I'm going to do a review of one of his books soon this is Erasmus Magister which I really fancied and Matt had this and basically this is about Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles, and it's a science fiction story. I'm interested in science fiction stories that involve historical characters. There's a Blake one by um, Ray Nelson, who died recently. Ray Nelson, who wrote the story which became They Live. And of course, there's Past Master by Ari Lafferty, which is an interesting book about Thomas More. And this is Erasmus Darwin. So there you go. And it's got a Diplodocus in the background. So I got that as well. Quite fancy that. That's different from his usual thing, which is usually sort of hard space opera, hard science, Arthur C. Clarke type thing. So there you go. So I thought that was quite interesting. Something I already have in a different livery and read, gosh, when was it? At least 30 years ago, maybe more is this rather fine book, The Green Gene by Peter Dickinson, represented here in Door. There you go. And Peter Dickinson, primarily a children's writer, he wrote lots of children's books, Carnegie Medal, that sort of thing, really good. He also wrote crime novels. There's a couple of crime novels which are alternate histories as well, in which a king or somebody who never became king and should have been becomes a detective king and joker's man they never caught on i was meant to read them but he writes really well and this is the green gene this is his only adult sf novel and this is about a genetic mutation happening where everybody's celtic irish and scots and the welsh i can't recall turns green and it's kind of a satirical thing the uk one was a panther i got it i am thinking of upgrading to a hardcover you can't really fault the door and i want to reread it it's been a long time and i remember it was really good and he's a great writer wrote the changes trilogy which was filmed for british tv in the 70s fantastic stuff so i'm very pleased with that as well so as you can see we've got the podium today with 
two stands on it thanks to Simon Proctor Simon thanks for buying the extra stands really needed them they were on the wish list and I completely forgot about them they turned up and as usual I checked the packaging away and I didn't look who it was from I couldn't find the thing so there you go so a few sort of paperbacks there just to finish off this haul this is something which I don't know a lot about I love the cover it's very creature from the Black Lagoon it's one of the ace science fiction specials now the ace science fiction specials had three runs it was the 60s the 70s and an 80s run and more often than not the books in them fell by the wayside and the later ones were edited by terry carr and this is from let's see this is from the um 70s run the 70s and 80s ones with terry carr um editing them the original ones i can't think who they must have been were they i think they were donald a wilhelm before he started door because he worked for ace so and there's some really great stuff in that but this is the 70s one and this is number two that series and that's red tide there you go red tide by dc chapman and dolores layman tarzan i kid you not what a name and Mike at Fine Edition has got one of these which is a much better neck but I thought I wanted to give it a go first before I invested so I might upgrade but I like the look of that I might read that soon and yeah it's about um, transforming amphibiously from a land animal into a water animal rather than the other way around so that's going to be quite interesting a bit of submerged SF so we're going to pop that on the podium there that's that and finally um this is an sf at all this is a book i had as a kid and i used to read and read and read it and one of my oldest school friends andrew humphrey humpy hey humpy hope you're okay out there he and i sort of bonded in our first year of secondary school and we both read this at the time and we used to quote it at each other and this is the best of morecambe and wise the scripts written by eddie braben marvelous stuff very very funny so and all these were like sort of three quid a pop or less i gave morris a bit more because he's such a good guy and i hadn't seen him for a while we're going to be going to do another video with morris probably i say we it's probably me and jules burt that will be in the autumn because he said he's got another unit with unlisted material Aha, can't wait for that so there you go so a little sort of bit of paperback action there i think you'll agree we've got some interesting variety and non-obvious stuff because you know anybody does the obvious stuff we're not really going to talk about the three body problem on this channel well we are at some point actually because me and graham are going to read it and we're going to take it to pieces and tell you what we think whether it actually is good but you know you can get that elsewhere you come here for the real meat it's not the entry level it's the finer stuff it's going deeper into the history and the context and what have you I'm going to get these out of the way and pop them there on the old wooden podium. It's dreadful, isn't it? It's brown. Got them from a craft shop. It used to be painted a gleaming white or something. So we'll just stick those there. We won't be so keen on the Morecambe and Wise. We'll just stick it there for a laugh. So, so what have I got? This is all going to be sort of stuff from Bob. I haven't paid him for this yet because Bob is, um, has got the builders in. And he's a bit of a chaotic week so there's some things i didn't pick up last time last time i went there, i was there quite a long time bought some stuff had a look for a bit more and what have you and i'm going to tear this bag open because it's bugging me and i've got several of them so a nice soft bag around the purchases because that sort of prevents too much edge wear going on because we don't really want the edge wear or anything so and you can see bob's warehouse on the channel as well mr book 451 good stuff and we'll have a look some of these we'll need to clean so what should we start with let's start with um something fairly standard um getting hard to get in good nick these definitely need to clean and we're talking about the early asimov one two your chris foss jackets they're very beautiful like you'd agree and three there you go unbroken spines unfaded gorgeous the proper standard no messing no leaning of spine it's what you want isn't it really chris foss so i do have all of these 
and of course they begin in the sort of 30s and they go on from there and in a way it's more about the sort of livery and these are panther of course so they're very beautiful there's still loads of these things out there but getting them in good nick is getting harder and harder so there you go so that's sort of like a little standard entry level thing i thought i'd sort of ease you in gently with but very pleased with those my asimov collection is growing i'm not a foundation guy i find it quite dull but I'm very much a robot guy apart from my robots. If this is your first time watching you're thinking where do I start? The robot books come before the Galactic Empire books which come before the Foundation books in Asimov's internal chronology though they weren't essentially written that way. So if you want to read them in internal chronology and I recommend that go with the robot books first. You don't have to read iRobot it's very clunky and dull. Go straight into The Caves of Steel his first full-length robot novel because that's fantastic that's really steps up as a writer and it's very interesting reading that in relation to Philip K Dick as well so on the Asimov front I have been thinking I want to read some of his crime fiction and this is a rather beautiful sphere book look at that a whiff of death and you notice that in those days he was just Asimov you know he was that famous you know you didn't even get that with Heinlein or Clark or Frank Herbert you just had Asimov pandered it with all this with the panel also but look at that isn't that beautiful so yeah so I want to pick up some more of these I'm going to give it a try it says a classic whodunit I'm not really into the puzzle aspect of crime writing I like it noir hardboard existential so we'll see but that's an interesting thing to give a go to then we move on to what do we move on to well I thought there was another one of these there will be more so it'll pop up British um, disaster fiction John Christopher aka Samuel Ude and this is the one about earthquakes and this is a lovely let's see Hodder there you go wrinkle in the skin and it's got the little sort of coronet chess piece type thing there and of course Hodder was originally it was four square then mutated into Hodder paperbacks and that split into Coronet and NEL New English Library which had some of the great sort of SF liveries of the 1970s. This is a 60s books but Earthquakes. Christopher I like but he is in my view not a patch on Wyndham. Wyndham is a far better stylist. Christopher's probably terser and harsher and a bit more realistic but Wyndham just has colour, character, wit He's just a far, far better writer in my opinion. Christopher's more stripped down, but his stuff is good. So there you go. If you want to hear a nice story about John Christopher, watch my tour of Bob's personal library from a few weeks back. Isn't that nice? Then we move on to a writer who I'm very fond of and who I'm rereading after a long sort of gap. And he's somebody who I don't think there's anything there's one book in print the continuous Catherine Morton Ho. I keep mentioning him on the channel and trying to get more people to read him you can get ebooks you can get stuff second hand about the only person I've seen read him and that was after he talked to me Matt of Book Pearled Red Farewell Earth's Bliss a while ago and loved it and it really is great stuff we're talking about DG Compton so I got some more Comptons today now these are books that I already have copies of but these are sort of upgrades or sideways grades so I'm going to take you through them now and really the thing with Compton he's the great moralist of SF and you know I do say the same things about authors because once you pin down where they are you know where they are and he had a lot of work published in the States he was initially more successful in the States than the UK which is interesting he wasn't really allied to the new wave even though his work came along in that period he wrote very few short stories I think there's only two or three so there's no collection I was discussing this with Jim Goddard of Leaky Boot Press and Kerosina not enough for a collection he wrote other things under the name Guy Compton which were crime novels he wrote gothics as Francis Lynch he's still alive he's in his 90s hasn't had a book out since the late 80s but really fantastic writer so we're going to show you some Comptons now and just pulling off the Christopher and Ike I never met an Ike I didn't like you get the steel crocodile and that's bagged there and in the UK that's called the electric crocodile that's the ace first edition there was a UK hard hardcover it's very hard to get when you see it it's an estate Greg Press did a reissue in the 70s they printed about 200 copies 
I am watching out for one, but it's not cheap, so we'll see. I got a fair amount of content in hardcover, but paperback is hard. So, and this is, um, let's see, Human Crisis in a Computer World. I haven't read this for such a long time. I can't remember anything about it, other than the fact it was good. And look at that beautiful Ace Special jacket. So that's the first generation Ace Special. And let's go back a step. Do we have the other ones? Yes, we do. And Red Tide is a 70s Ace Special. And I'll try and dig out an 80s one for you as well. So there you go. And I say, I think Donald A. Wilhelm edited this series and they're just spectacular stuff. They're so good. Also, DG Compton, this is Ace as well. I've already got one of these. Mine's badly spine faded, so this is an upgrade. And I do have a hardcover, which I got recently from Cold Tonnage as well. And this is The Missionaries. And The Missionaries is one of the more sort of satiric, funny ones. And it's kind of comparable to Farewell Earth's Blesh. And it's about this race of religious aliens who come as missionaries to Earth. And they come to Devon and Cornwall, I seem to recall. And there's a fair amount of social comedy in it. And it's an interesting sort of thing to compare to Barry and Marsburg's in the enclosure, which is about aliens who are discovered and they are locked away in a Guantanamo Bay type thing and they're sort of interrogated. So it's an interesting one. So I might reread re the two together and do something about that because that would be keen. And yeah, very, very nice. So this is Ace again. This is slightly later. I think this one's early 70s. And I also picked this up. This is the next book I'm going to read. And I'm going to read it for an upcoming feature, which you might see before this. You know the way I do it. I mess around with the time on things. And this was Compton's, I think, second book, maybe. And it's something which he had a lot of acclaim for in the States. And I've never seen a UK copy. And this is a later Berkeley edition from 79. The Ace one was 68. And that's Synthia Joy. I think that makes it his third or fourth book. And Synthia Joy is a kind of a precursor of some cyberpunk things in a way. I'll talk about that when I do a video about it. So I got this as a reading copy because the Ace one is much nicer and I want to keep it. There is one hardcover out there on eBay and it's just a complete mess. It's not going to happen. So that's that Synthia Joy. Great title. And this had a big impact when it came out and was very widely acclaimed. And it's really about sort of how technology can be used in a sort of sim stim way like Gibson does in Neuromancer, sort of fitting yourself into people's consciousness and vicariously experiencing what they're experiencing and the moral implications of that. And um, yeah, really good stuff. So I'm looking forward to rereading that because remember it was great when I read it, but it's been a very long time. Then we move into the hardcore area of serious paperback, uh, paperback upgrading. And um, these are a couple of things which um, are really uncommon um, in this condition. They're very beautiful. They're both books I've read. They're books I have in other versions. We're going to take a look at them in a moment. I'm going to pop that there and eventually we might even get a stack high enough. Is that high enough? No, it'll happen. It'll happen. We'll have another stack and really um, these are absolutely gorgeous and they're both Panthers. They're from the same decade and well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put them up there. That's the Disaster Area by J.G. Ballard. And do Android Stream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. Right. Feast Your Eyes. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, of course, the picture on the cover of this is to illustrate Stormbird Storm Dreamer, which is a great story. And I've got a cape signed edition of this, but it's not first, it's a reprint from the 80s. And it's years since I've read it, but this has got oh, the stories in this, the concentration city, the subliminal man, manhole 69. Concentration city is about where the whole world has become a technopole. It's just one big city. Fantastic stuff. And the subliminal man is about advertisements and manhole 69 is about an experiment where people go without sleep and it's really nightmarish. Fantastic new wave stuff. Absolutely beautiful. Look at that. Gorgeous. And it's got the quotation from Graham Greene on the cover, one of the best science fiction books I've read. I would love to know what other SF Graham Greene did read, actually, because I do like Greene. He's fantastic. And, you know, you won't see something as beautiful as this very often. I still got my 76 edition, but you don't see this one very much. Absolutely lovely. Um, this may be a Panther first. This 30 piece is probably not, because that's early 70s edition, but 
gorgeous. Look at that. They are going to stay bagged, I think. Lovely. Legacy material. What else do we have? There's plenty more. There really is. So moving the new waivers aside, let's just see if we can get another stand in. Bear with me. Right, now we're moving into the big league. Three stands, good grief. What have we got? We've got a few things which are loose in here. Um, right, well, this is an interesting one. I've always fancied this. So I'm gonna stick them up on the podium and talk through them, um, see what we've got. Okay. There we go. There we go. Right. So, mixed bag. We've got 60s, 70s and 80s out of order. Let's do it in the right order. Left to right is read 60s, 70s, 80s. Vintage action. John Christopher again. And this is Pendulum, which is not one I've read. Yeah. Okay, this looks very, very, um, this is political SF, near future, my sort of thing, interesting, not a catastrophe novel. That's probably more in the vein of Fig for a Darkly Island. Mm, okay, yeah, dystopian. Yeah, I like the look of that. So that's gonna be an interesting one. So we see how he does with just pure social SF on changes which are not technological, but technologically expli explicable through sociology or soft science. Then we've got Brother Esau by Douglas Orgill and John Gribbon. Now John Gribbon, of course, a science writer, really good one. His book um, on Schrodinger's cat, what's it called, In Search of Schrodinger's Cat, it's about quantum mechanics. I've read it half a dozen times, it's brilliant. And this, let's see, Douglas Orgill, I was a science writer as well and this is from it's actually 82 so oh gosh I'm wrong it's not a 70s book and it's Tor um, so it's an American one Brother Esau and it's sort of interesting because of course in the Bible the, in the Old Testament Esau is sort of hairy you know and he's going to be the inheritor um, of his father's wealth but his mother Rebecca Raps, is it Joseph? I can't recall. And this is where I'm showing terrible knowledge of biblical exegesis. I used to know all this stuff. Wraps the non hairy brother's arms in goat fur because their father is blind and it's sort of passed on there. And I think um, the direct quotation in the Bible is he was a plain man living in tents. So <laughs> there you go. So that's going to be interesting. So this is. Um, Let's see. And the Lord said unto Rebekah, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people. And the one people shall be stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25. And this is set in the Himalayas. So, you know, you put biblical stuff into anything and it immediately gets a certain sort of power. So that's going to be very interesting. This is an 80s book I remember really well. This is Bridget Burt's Barry Hart, which is sort of a bit of shinosery. I seem to remember it's set in China or in a sort of alternate sort of Eastern sort of kingdom. And this, I think this won the World Fantasy Award. It won something in the late 70s, um, late 80s, I should say. And I used to sell it all the time. And I remember a larger for a B format edition, which was yellow. Never met, never read it. I was me to get around to it. I don't read a lot of fantasy these days. I'm more interested in things which are literary fantasy and a little bit different. So that's going to be very interesting. Number 10 Ox is the name of one of the titular characters. There you go, not a titular character, central character. You can tell I'm not well, can't you? You know, it really is. So there you go. So that's some, a mixed bag of interesting stuff there. And we move onwards. This is a book which I've almost bought many times in its limited edition from Zeising, Mark Zeising, American bookseller, small press, the uh, sort of guy who's been doing all great stuff for years. And that's Kim Stanley Robinson's A Short Sharp Shock. I finally decided to get that because it'll stop me buying a hardcover and spending, you know, anything between 10 and 50 quid. So the hardcover is nice. It comes a slipcase, white cloth. But really, I'm not a massive Kim guy. And this is sort of about the last thing I want by him, really. So 
and it's a fairly early one it's I think it's just before the Mars things so that sort of like is a little filler for me and I think I'm probably done with Kim now I don't think I'll be buying anything else um, I got all the early stuff in first edition that's the stuff that counts so there you go a little filler couple of upgrades um, one of my favorite English SF writers who I always describe as adolescent and romantic with a small r is the very wonderful Michael G. Coney, Michael Greater X Coney. This book here is Neptune's Cauldron and Neptune's Cauldron is a book which I and my old friend Graham, the grumpy old man who appears with me in the grumpy old man thread on the channel and we looked for that for years, it seemed like years and this is Monitor Found in Orbit in Door which is his short story collection and I have both these books, but I'm upgrading. Neptune's Cauldron is published by, let's have a look, um, Tower. And it's an undersea adventure and it's, it's okay. There's actually quite a few of them out there. There's loads of them out there. But before the internet, you know, you just had to come across things. So it was all about chance. Um, and we both came across it eventually. And it is a minor one. I think with Michael G. Coney, he was at his peak mid 70s. But he had a few sort of books tucked into desk drawers and this and probably the ultimate jungle was one of them but i do like the ultimate jungle and i'm going to talk about it one day in the context of how i feel it falls between two of brian aldis's most famous novels so there you go so that's a bit of fun akin in some ways to medusa's children by bob shaw not as good i mean medusa's children is an underrated book people say it's very minor it is but it's really beautifully written for a minor book it's well worth spending your time on there are some other minor shows which are less good i was like fire patterns a classic example but medusa's children is good so that's a bit of underwater fun which again kind of ties in with this red tide thing so maybe we're entering a submersible phrase who can say monitor fans in orbit short stories uncommon i've got a garland yellow jacket first say so this is a door and my original one is a door and it's in a state and that's going to go to my friend nick so there you go lovely you can't really argue with that beautiful stuff i think you will agree then we get all 80s again and that's all very well and groovy and fine with me i can tell you that much now because the 80s was when i started book selling and I loved it. It was just a fantastic time. There were still exciting things happening in science fiction publishing, particularly in the States. The early 80s in the UK, amazing things going on with Ballard and Priest and people like Kilworth and Holdstock were really coming on. Really great stuff. And of course, you have the stirrings of cyberpunk at the end of the 70s and then into the 80s. Gibson. And there was just this amazing renaissance of brilliant American writers mid to late 80s Lucius Shepard, Michael Swanick, Lewis Shiner, all these fantastic people and then you know a few years after that things blended out terribly but it's a great time. So a couple of nostalgia buys which I wasn't going to go for and then I changed my mind oh no the big cat theme reasserts itself with a vengeance. Is he going to regret getting rid of some of his big cat stuff? We've also got a unicorn thing as well going on. So it's all creatures. Now the light in here, typically in this house, you can't see a thing because it's so light. So I'm going to do what I can with that. And um, we might have to come back to that. But anyway, what we got here, we've got Claire Bell, Rathus Creature and Clan Ground. These are a few printings. These are sort of graft and paperbacks from the 80s. Um, it looks like this tiger is smoking a cigar but it's a burning brand if you'll forgive that and um yeah it's interesting because there's some debate about whether these are actually ya books or not i've never read them i remember selling them at the time and they weren't major um got silver on that cover. never buy a book you can get these in hardcover quite cheap but i thought again if i pick these up from bob there'll be a couple of quid and it'll stop me you know vicariously buying the hard covers just because they're nice so we'll see so those books i used to sell michael bishop unicorn mountain let's pull this from here because i can see the glare is going to annoy the hell out of us really so michael bishop unicorn mountain um very beautiful and this is a book about let's see I think there's something to do in, in this with AIDS or HIV, I can't recall. But it's a story of four people whose lives are transformed by a herd of unicorns. Now, I don't normally do this sort of unicorn thing. 
there's no doubt an influence from Peter S. Beagle in this, but Bishop's fantastic writer, great guy. He's had a really rough time over the over the last sort of 10 years or more. And I really feel for him. We've never met. We've had contacts. Um, I got in touch with him when I put his book, Ancient of Days, in my book. And a lovely, lovely man. He's had a really, really rough time. And he's a fantastic humanist SF writer. I used to have this in hardcover and this livery and I got rid of it. And why? You know, space is something that's really uncommon. The American Arbor House edition is nice as well. So that's that. I've never actually got around to reading it. So maybe I will because I haven't read any Bish for ages and he's great. Really, really good. So obviously this is a super shiny book. So that's really, really nice. So that'll do until I can upgrade. And this will probably be my reading copy. Lovely stuff. Peter S. Beagle, The Last Unicorn, who've never heard of it, is the definitive unicorn novel. It's a fantasy novel, just been reissued in hardcover and paperback. If you're a fantasy fan and you like Patrick Rothfuss, it's Patrick Rothfuss's favourite book. There you go. You couldn't get it for years in the UK. I used to sell on imports to bring in, it would always sell it. And I would just write on a little card underneath it, Patrick Rothfuss's favourite book, and that would sell it. There you go. And you're probably better writer than Rothfuss anyway, probably. I um, mean, certainly in a literary sense, but there you go. So a little bit of 80s nostalgia. We are coming to the end now, um, but I'm trying to work out what order to do stuff in. Because as you see, this is quite a haul. And I think we're going to do the hard covers. If I dig in here. This is a set which um, Bob put aside for me. And this is typical of the sort of thing that Bob has. And he's got very good prices and the condition is there. So do get in touch with him if you're looking for this sort of stuff. I'm trying to get the sticker off this, but I'm not going to bother. Um, this is a trilogy, a fantasy trilogy, a fantasy trilogy on this channel. Never. There we go. And again, we have a horrible glare. And is there any point to any of this, we ask ourselves? Uh, we'll see, we'll see. We'll pull it around. Right, Robert Holdstock. I'm just going to brandish these actually. This is getting on my nerves. The thing with this house, it's great to have a lot of light, but it's a real devil to film in as a result. But I'm just going to show you these now anyway. So Robert Holdstock. If you know who Robert Holdstock is, um, you need to remedy that and read Mythago Wood, winner of the World Fantasy Award, circa 85, 84, 85. Great book. And Robert specialised in sort of Celtic and British matter of Britain fantasy. He used to write like a science fiction writer. His early books are all SF books. And they have the kind of influence of Ursula Gann over them. They're really good. They sort of like very fresh air. It's like a nice cool wind blowing through you when you read them. And they're great. And they're quite easy to get. This is a later trilogy from the 90s. Um, the Merlin Codex. And this is the first one. This is Celtica. Very beautiful. I think you'd agree. And this is published by Tor. So this is an American one. Now in the UK, this had the same jacket and was published by Earthlight, which was Simon & Schuster's SF and fantasy imprint in the early 90s, which was run by John Gerald, who then became an agent. I remember me and John talking on the phone in the 90s and we met years later. We've been talking about going for a beer for 30 years and we've never got around to it. I think he's retired now, so it might actually happen because he's very friendly with Jim Burns. One of my regular customers is friendly with him and he comes down this way now and again. So we are going to do it. So me, him and Jim will probably go out for a meal at some point. Yes, we've talked about it. It's just getting it together is all it is really. So yeah, and the basic idea of these is, is Merlin, so it's Arthurian stuff. And he sort of gets together with classical characters, maybe a little bit earlier than the Arthurian period. I didn't pick these up at the time because I read a lot of Holstock. I got a little bit tired of his Celtic shtick, but you know, he was really good. Um, died sadly very young. He was about 60. Great shame. I saw him about a year before he died. Um, lovely man. And we talked on the phone and met once before that. So yes, yeah, so I thought I'd pick these up. But interestingly, these all have different liveries. This is book two of the Merlin Codex. And this is the Iron Grail. So as you can see, they have a common livery. Yeah, so, oh God. <laughs> they have a common livery. But this, interestingly, is not a tall one. It's an Earthlight one. So this is a UK one. This is an American one. So they're mismatched. But I kind of like mixing it up sometimes because this here is volume three, The Broken Kings, which, as you can see, is a Golanx hardcover. So the trilogy, different publishers all. So if you stuck to UK editions, you'd have, the, you'd have these two in Earthlight 
and then you'd have that one in Golang because Earthlight kind of fell apart when John left and I don't know what happened there but I think there was some sort of schism between him and Simon and Schuster and Simon and Schuster had Christopher Priest at that time they didn't particularly handle Chris's stuff very well either that particularly was a thing after John had gone and you know they they sort of fumbled the ball really it was a great shame the 90s was a strange time in British SF publishing a lot was changing and Granada Grafton had become Harper Collins the fire and water symbol and Voyager was launched and Voyager was too much about fantasy and not enough about SF for my liking and even though Jane Johnson ran it my friend Jane I I wasn't really happy about the way that the list was going it went a lot more fantasy oriented and Voyager to me has never had the strong character that Panther Granada Grafton had and when I was book selling in the 80s and running SF sections directly I wasn't doing any management stuff then apart from the odd bit I managed one bookshop for six months and I had supervisory roles but I wasn't sort of shop managing really in the 80s it was the 90s onwards it was very much a thing that the first catalogue you would turn to when you were doing your stock for an SF and fantasy section was always Grafton Granada Panther. You know, it was like the the basis of what you did in putting a section together. And that faded in the 90s, which is a shame. So there you go. So you've got a trilogy, um, three different publishers, two different liveries. So you cannot get the same livery for all three, which is quite sort of interesting and exciting, really. It's, um, you know, <laughs> frustrates some people. Me, I'm not bothered. I'm just not bothered. So that's what you've got there. And what else have we got? We're moving on to the final stage now. And I've got a set of magazines here because um, I'm not really a magazine guy, but these are magazines which are in book format. And I know Jules and I, last time we were at Bob's, he picked up a set of these. I already had some of them. But I said to Bob, can you pull a load together for me? And we're talking about SF Impulse. Now, SF Impulse was published in this A format paperback, um, even though it was a magazine, on a quarterly basis by Robertson Vintner Compact Books. And this is number one. And before this, it was called Science Fantasy. And Science Fantasy and New Worlds were edited in that period, the early 60s, by E.J. Carnell, Ted Carnell who later went on then to do new writings in SF. And Ted Carnell had been like the curator of British F SF publishing in the sort of fan sense and magazine sense, you know, since before the war, when Nova Terrae, which became New Worlds, New Earth, Nova Terrae, was the thing. And he decided that he was going to move on and start this anthology series, New Writings in SF, which they used to be about three or four year. And Compact Books, Vintner and Roberts had bought up um, science fantasy and new worlds and they said okay we're going to sort of get new editors in and Carnell recommended Moorcock and everybody thought that Moorcock would go for science fantasy to edit it because of course he was writing the early Elric stories by that point and they'd been really popular in science fantasy so you know it was a natural thing but no Mike took on new worlds and then the world changed. Impulse was initially edited by Kirill Bonfiglioli who was better known as a crime writer. He wrote the Charlie Mordecai series. Don't point that thing at me, it's two sequels, some other stuff. And he was like a raconteur, art dealer, fine art expert, fencing sort of guy. And the Mordecai novels are kind of a sort of PG Woodhouse meets with Nail and I via antique crimes. And there was a film of one of them with Johnny Depp. I mean, Johnny Depp always wants to play the cool people, even if he doesn't suit it. You know, he's, he's a good guy, you know, but you know, usually he's miscast in a lot of these things and they fall apart as a result. But Kirill Bonfiglioli did it. And he wrote some great SF as well. But he was a bit of a sort of, you know, a come day, go day sort of guy, apparently. And the real sort of managing editor work, the real sort of meat of it, was done by Keith Roberts. And Keith Roberts did a lot of the covers of these because he was an artist as well as a writer. And Keith was very big in things like printing, advertising, what have you. And he was a real tartar if you'd got things wrong, you know. And you'll find out about that in the Kerasina video on the channel. So I decided to fill my impulse gaps because they did some great, great stuff. So I've got a stack of them here and I'm just going to go through them. And I think I needed 10 and Bob's got me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm still too short, but there's one thing here I'd never come across. So we'll come to that. So that was the first one. Lots of great stuff in this. Um, when Bon, as he was affectionately known, kind of fell off the wagon, Harry Harrison took over and 
between Harry and Keith they did an amazing job and then of course there's the famous story which I referred to which I can't resist and I'd love to know about the time where Ballard was supposedly going to get involved with editorial on Impulse and I think but they hoped that Ballard would become editor of Impulse and that Moorcock would remain editor of New Worlds and that it would be like this huge new wave powerhouse but it didn't happen because um, Keith and JG fell out and there's different sort of versions of the story and nobody wants to talk about it I'd love to know I know it's terribly gossipy but it does really does really get me and the idea is is that I think Moorcock once said to me or well, I read something he said that the had to separate them or there'd have been a fist fight probably wasn't that dramatic but it's a great story I think you'll agree so yeah impulse so I've got a little set here we're just going to go through them I'm going to show you the covers one or two I might have to upgrade so that's number one and then number two we've got this isn't in such good nick that's a needs upgrading but I just wanted to get them as reading copies this has got a Keith Roberts jacket and that is the Lady Anne from Pavan. Pavan was published um, as a fix-up but it was initially an impulse and of course when it was published in the book it was changed to Lady Margaret because it's a tie-in with the central female character in the first part which is the Lady Margaret. Jesse, um, Jesse Stone. Is this Jesse Stone? Jesse Strange is the main protagonist and this is just wonderful stuff and artwork by Keith so I'll have to upgrade that some part but that will do for now and there's just amazing stuff in this Ju you know Judith Merrill John Brenner really beautiful and we move on here's number three and this has got Keith Roberts as well Pavan Pavan runs a serial through this is a Ardaboo Mackleworth Alistair Bevan who's Keith Roberts and other stuff and John Rankin the seventh moon lovely look at that isn't that cool then we get number four and this has got a great cover these are mostly Keith Roberts covers where I know I know that one isn't no that one is the first one I showed you isn't this is a Roberts cover as well and it's Mac Reynolds Mac Reynolds really interesting writer he was about the only real out there socialist in American SF in the 60s and 70s and his work is usually quite short sharp there's some commercial things but there are some utopian and socialist things which are really good and I, I like Mac Reynolds he's um workman like at times but always very interesting and one of the very few socialist openly socialist SF writers of this generation because he comes before the new wave so there you go and there's a Chris Boyce story and Chris Boyce is somebody who career peaked in the late 70s with Brain Fix and Catch World you never hear much about him and I think he did one other novel after that possibly though I may be thinking of somebody else and there's a lot of his work in Impulse as well he's quite an interesting obscure figure then we get Day Million Frederick Pohl which of course there's a pan lozenge of the collection Day Million and this also includes in this one and it's a serial and I think it's across Let's see, I think it's across several issues. Um, let's see, is it in here? Yes, across several issues is Harry Harrison's Make Room, Make Room, Silent Green. And a part of that is in here, marvellous stuff. And there's more Alistair Bevan, which of course is Keith again. So Keith's getting more stuff under the radar and a beautiful surrealist cover by Keith there in the manner of Dali. You can't really go wrong with that, can you? fantastic stuff I would like to collect Keith's original artwork but I've no way of going around doing it Keith Keith is um did know um Jim Burns and Jim says he's going to give me a few pointers but we'll see I guess but Jim's a retired man so you've got to let him do things at his own pace then another great serial which appeared in Impulse um alongside Pavan and Make Room Make Room is Michael Moorcock's The Ice Schooner fantastic Robert's cover again there was a story by Keith which I think happens in the same world as Moorcock's Ice Schooner and you know Philip Reeve the children's SF writer he wrote the Moving Cities one um, what's it called Mortal Engines which is you know basically takes the idea from Inverted World Moving City well his second book in that series is set in a sort of ice sort of thing as well and it's very like the Ice Schooner very like that so but he writes really well Philip Reeve but you can see his influences all over him if you know British adult SF but really really beautiful I think you'll agree lovely stuff so I have a few gaps to fill with this and then we can maybe think about upgrades moving on to number 10 impulse I think ran for 12 issues and this is number 10 and all sorts of good names on there 
There we are. More Moorcock, Aldis, Dish. Fantastic new wave stuff. And finally in this tranche, this is number 11, the, the last but one. And it has the ending of the ice schooner in it, which is obviously across three or four issues. And this is, there you go. That's Mantis by Chris Boyce. More Roberts again. Lovely. So a bit of magazine stuff there. Am I going to fall down the magazine rabbit hole? Well, no, it's a simple answer. I do cherry pick. As you've seen, I cherry pick with books. Over the years, that's built into quite an impressive SF library of firsts, focusing on literary quality. I will be showing some magazines off soon. I'm looking at some anniversary editions, which are in really tip top condition, but I'm not going to go too far down that because books is the focus because I'm assembling the final library. I know there's been a lot of book haul and collecting stuff on here recently. That's because of where I am at what stage I'm of my sort of SF life when I'm pulling together the final things to kind of complete the collection and that will probably go off another year and a half or so and then that'll probably wind down because then there's a lot of stuff that needs to be read I haven't read and when I quit work it's a few years off yet it's not going to be buying it's going to be just reading curating and maybe some dealing we'll see we're going to finish off with something which is I've never seen never come across it and the fact that it's numbered really makes me think that there must be others and I don't know this series at all so I'm really surprised it's absolutely beautiful neck and um, this is compact again SF reprise number six so six that means there's five others now whether they're all in this format I don't know so I need to do some research so really this is um, looking at the best writing from the past issues of science fantasy and impulse so there you go Keith Roberts cover again um, edited it says collected by um, Kill Bonfiglioli so in this case they're probably from the Bon issues it's just that another editor sort of you know stuck them together underneath that because Bon would have moved on to other things by then with his antique dealing and his fencing and his raffish behavior so yeah and really really beautiful and a nice chunky anthology and bagged so gorgeous so that's what I picked up from the guys. There will be more visits to their warehouses. There'll be another big dealer visit later in the year with somebody I've known for years but never visited. That will come up. And I think that's it for now. So what I've got to do now is I've got to sort of take pictures of some of this and compile a list and send off to Bob so I can pay him. What a life, eh? Just been to the post office, sent off some eBay sales. Thought I'd do the charity shops. It's a bit sad, really, where in a city like this, where there used to be sort of 10 second hand bookshops, from second hand bookshops, now there's only one, it's just charity shops, but we'll see what we can find. And where I'm walking now, just to the side there, that's where Mary Shelley wrote most of Frankenstein. The original house is gone, so great shame. There you go. That's the 1818 text, of course, one with Percy involved. That's the one to have.
Thursday morning in between the other stuff, waiting for the shopping to come, about to go out and maybe do some filming in the wild. Got a few things, a book haul, it's not a book haul, it's probably part of a collector's diary or something else. Um, what have I picked up? Um, Heinlein, Do Into Summer, Pan Lozenge, very uncommon. Tragically with leaning spine, look at that, that's just not on is it really? really isn't but you know collection filler until one can upgrade don't see this one very much i've got a really nice um golanx it's not a masterwork it's the ones that came before the masterworks got a really nice one of those but you know that'll be a reading copy until i upgrade so there you go something i was talking about the other day um fritz lieber i said i wasn't talking about it scott bradfield was talking about it you're all alone and i really fancied that he had this edition and i have mixed feelings about lieber i have to say so ace lovely managed to get the only one that appeared to be on sale in the uk very nice indeed like that pan lozenge again managed to acquire a very fine edition of day million by frederick poli still own this one and you know sort of stupidly got rid of it and this was about like two quid ridiculous and also what can we say about it there was one in the states about 15 pounds forget it it's not going to happen very nice pleased with that talked about yukio mishima the other day decided to get the mini penguin cloth bound of death in midsummer i do have mixed feelings about these they're very small but you know they're quite beautiful so that means my original um they have very common livery these they all look the same is going because of space reasons i'm not too sentimental about this one in terms of cover so that's going to go on sale the link to my ebay is in the banner at the top of the channel and you can search me as outlaw bookseller on ebay i'm selling stuff off there so that's going there decent prices also being sold because i replaced that as well is osamu dazai a shameful life aka no longer human that's going on sale as well pristine paper because you can see because i was in work and it just kept looking at me i kept seeing this no longer human from new directions hardcover this sort of 60s style jacket which is absolutely gorgeous and i thought i kind of gotta have it really so there you go so that that goes on sale as well also going on sale because i realized i've got two copies another pan laws and 100 years of science fiction slight bit of sun fading down there um otherwise spiffing beautifully clean on the back good anthology i'm going to be reviewing this soon in fact by the time you've seen this you've probably seen the review come up what else is happening well penguin um this is probably a jules bertie thing a little flyer here they're bringing the green back to their crime and espionage look at that a little map there and the thing is is they're doing these in b format not in a oh, the lightweights so you know there you go and um little thing and i've got a poster here so i really should keep this for jewels because you know i don't know whether you want this um am i going to buy any of them well a lot of them are the same old same old that we've seen many times but something they are doing um, and i've got one aside in work and i'll probably show you later in this video is rampo's book um can we get it in the screen there let's see that that one there no not that one there steve oh, god that one there the guy with the eyes japanese very slim looks good gonna go for that and that's about it really what a crap bit of video <laughs> you'll love it really
couple of little crackers here from Oxfam in Malmesbury. Um, Doris Lessing, Memoirs of a Survivor, film town edition, Picador, which I've been thinking I needed a copy of. And that was great, nice and cheap. A little bit of a ding there, but otherwise perfect. Do love the old Picador's SF novel, of course. And I've got one of these. I bought one back in the day, early 80s King Penguin of Angela Carter, Heroes and Villains. But it was just so nice, I couldn't leave it there. That's going to be on the eBay and sell that on rather than leave it where some Philistine would break the spine or something. Nice. Great SF novel. Sort of Brave New World in a way, but very florid, dripping with sensuality. Future barbarians live in the jungle inside a walled city. The professors and Marianne, one of the daughters, seeks to break free. Erotic stuff and really, really great. Lovely.